بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الاصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على نبي هذه الامه وامام الائمه سيد انبياء الله محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين سيما بقيه الله في الارضين وحجته على الخلائق اجمعين الحجه بن الحسن فداه وارواح العالمين السلام عليك يا ابا عبد الله وعلى الارواح التي حلت بفنائك واناخت برحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما اصاب من مصيبه في الارض ولا في انفسكم الا في كتاب من قبل ان نبراها صدق الله العلي العظيم رسالة الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الله صلى الله عليه الله صلى الله عليه Zainab, a third level of Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. In the previous nights, I felt like I wasn't doing justice to the English-speaking audience. But tonight, inshallah, I will compensate since this night and the coming nights are dedicated to Lady Zainab. And if we understood the role of Lady Zainab, then we have understood what Ashura represents. But allow me to start from the very last chapter of her life, which is unfolding before our eyes today. Lady Zainab happens to be buried in a war-torn country today, descending in a full-scale civil war in which a person cannot trust his neighbor. In every quarter in Syria, there is a conflict, people killing each other, and people getting killed, the lives that have been claimed since the start of the conflict, start of the conflict, is more than 100,000 lives, and over 3 million people have been displaced in that country. Now, we have nothing to do with the struggle between the president of Syria and the people of Syria. Maybe the people of Syria have the right to elect their own president, their own ruler. Maybe the president doesn't represent the majority of the people in Syria. We don't care about that. What we are concerned about is our holy sites. When credible threats were made against the shrine of Lady Zainab, and when I say credible threats, because the Wahhabis mentality, the only thing they worry about when they invade a country, when they occupy a country, when they enter a country, is to demolish all the holy sites, especially the ones associated with Ahlul Bayt This is their notion and their idea of an Islamic empire. They don't care about people's welfare. All they care about is to demolish the grave sites, that's it. And unfortunately, this only applies to the grave sites that are associated with the Shias or associated with the Ahl al-Bayt When they see that there is a personality that the Shias revere and respect and consider holy, then they have to exhibit animosity towards that personality. I've heard this myself from a Wahhabi scholar by the name of Taha Dilaydi. You can look it up, it's on YouTube. He says it. 
he says that the Sunnis in general, and he's addressing Sunni scholars and Sunni speakers in Iraq specifically, he says that the Sunni scholars shouldn't make a mention of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, Imam al Hussein is revered, supposed to be revered by all Muslims. Imam al Hussein is the grandson of Rasulullah. Didn't the Prophet say that Imam al Hassan and Hussein are the masters of the youth of paradise? We should all believe in that, right? But he said we shouldn't talk about Imam al Hussein because Hussein has become a symbol for the Shias. The Shias are talking about him. The Shias lament the Imam for his tragedies. Therefore, we shouldn't talk about Imam Hussein. We should boycott Imam Hussein. And if we ever, if we were forced to talk about Imam Hussein, then we should talk about another version of Imam Hussein. Not the oppressed one. Not the one that was killed in Karbala. Because these are all fabrications made by the Shias. His burial place, his martyrdom, and everything is about fabrication. So this is what their enmity towards Shias lead to. That they become against Ahlul Bayt themselves. And that's why there's a hadith that says that a Nasibi is not someone that exhibits enmity towards us. Because you wouldn't find someone cursing Fatima Zaha or cursing Imam al Hassan or Imam al Hussein outright. But to the ones that curse you, the ones that are against the Shias of Ahlul Bayt, because they can't directly display their enmity towards Ahlul Bayt, but what they do is they show their animosity towards the Shias of Ahlul Bayt, but in reality they are against Ahlul Bayt themselves. And this is what Taha al was saying. So incredible threats were made against the shrine of Lady Zainab after they demolished the gravesite of Hajar ibn Ali and they shelled the tomb of Amar ibn Yasir. There is a shrine that belongs to Khalid ibn al-Walid in Hams in Syria, which was controlled by the opposition, by the rebels, but they didn't touch it. And when, uh, when the Syrian government bombed that place because rebels were inside it, they made a big fuss about it, saying that the government is against Islamic heritage, the government is against Muslim figures, the government is against the companions of the Prophet. If you don't believe in shrines and you think that this is a form of infidelity and shirk, why don't you demolish the grave of Khalid ibn Walid? Why don't you demolish the grave of Ibn Taymiyyah that I've seen myself? He's buried in Damascus and he's the innovator of these ideas. And he was the one that said all forms of shrines are a form of shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't demolish his shrine simply because there is no association between them, these individuals like Khadim al Walid or Ibn Taymiyyah, with the Shias or with Ahlul Bayt. So they remain intact. They protect them. When credible threats were made against the shrine of Lady Zainab, thousands upon thousands of young men converted to Zainabiyya in the southern part of the capital city of Syria to protect and shield the Haram, the mausoleum of Zainab They laid their soul before Zainab And although there are volunteers, people coming to support the opposition from different parts of the world, from Libya, from Tunisia, from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, in thousands. And there are thousands of people that go to protect the shrine of Lady Zainab. But because of the involvement of these young men that went to protect the shrine of Sayyidina Zainab this changed the equation in Syria and tipped the balance in favor of the government because they didn't allow the terrorists to raid the area and demolish the shrine of Sayyidina Zainab. We all know that the Wahhabis destroyed the shrines of our Imams in Baqiyah and they destroyed Salwa. But for us, for the Shias, Sayyidina Zainab represents something else. Why the passion? Why the affection? 
Why the love that people exhibit? And I've been asked numerous times when I was in Iraq last year by probably tens of young men about whether or not it's, it's permissible for them to go and fight alongside the government to protect the shrine of Sayyidah Zainab Because Sayyidah Zainab took a central role after, after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein All of a sudden, Lady Zainab became the standard bearer of Ashura. Because Imam Zain al-Abidin couldn't. Imam Zain al-Abidin would have been killed. She was guided by the Imam, directed by Imam Zain al-Abidin, but she had to take a central role. She had to be in the limelight, in the spotlight. She had to confront the tyrants, and she had to argue with them, and she had to deliver sermons, and she had to del deliver lectures in numerous places. And if it wasn't for Sayyidah Zainab, brothers and sisters, we would be sitting here tonight to commemorate the tragedy of Imam Hussein They killed Imam Hussein to silence him, not knowing that he had a sister called Zainab. My father, in one of his books, says that if Zainab was a man, she would have been Hussein. And if Hussein was a woman, he would have been Zayn. It's unbelievable. Suddenly, all the women and children sought refuge in Zainab, alayhi salam, in the aftermath. The aftermath of Ashura wasn't any less tragic than the tragedy that happened on the day of Ashura. Yes, it wasn't as dramatic and as intense, but it wasn't any less tragic. I mentioned the story a couple of nights ago here. There was a man who came to Kabbalah on the first day of Muharram last year, an old man. I saw him when I was there during the Arba'i. We stayed in the same Hussaini. He said that when I came to Kabbalah, I told him, I'm Hussein, Ya Abu Abdullah, I will be staying in Kabbalah until Zainab goes and comes back, which means that he wants to stay there until the Arba'i. He said that I asked him, I'm Hussein, alayhi salam, to just grant me one hajj. All I asked him was one thing. I don't want anything for this material world. I don't want anything for my Akhara and the hereafter. All I asked him was to give me a tearful eye, to allow me to cry nonstop for Hussein. I don't want my tears to dry. I want to cry continuously. And he would go to the shrine of Imam Hussein from Fajr and pray Salat al-Subah there until sunset, he would stay in the Haram, he recites the ziyara, recites a few du'as, prays, but then all he does, apart from praying and du'a and ziyara, is cry for Imam Hussein And we have a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 70,000 angels that are always in the shrine of Imam Hussein that would weep for Imam Hussein. When we're talking about angels, we're not talking about robots. We're talking about people that have intellect, people that understand, people that saw the tragedy happen before their eyes, and this is why they cry all the time. So he said, until the 25th of Muharram, when I realize that I can't cry anymore, how much can a person cry? Even if a mother grieves at her son's death, it's a, it's a, it's a very grave calamity, but, uh, our tears are limited. They cry for a certain amount of time, then they can't cry anymore. So I couldn't cry anymore. So I went to Abu Abdullah, said to him, Ibn Rasulullah, all I asked you was to be able to cry for you non-stop. And you took away, and you took away this, you took this away from me. He said, when all of a sudden, this barrier, this layer that obstructs our view and and don't allow us to view the metaphysical world was removed from my eyes. I saw Imam Hussein alayhi salam in front of me. He said to me, just said to me two things. He said to me that Ashura, where the highlight, the climax of the tragedy, happened twice. Once was when the actual tragedy happened, when Imam Hussein was killed. And the second, or the 
climax of the tragedy that happened again was after my martyr. And he allowed me to see the scene after Imam Hussein was killed, when the enemies raided the tents and burnt the tents, and when all the women and children were crying and running around the tents. He said, when I saw that, oh my God, he said, I will never be able to stop from crying anymore until the day I die. He said, I can't describe to you what I saw, but it was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. So what happened in the aftermath was unbelievable. But the role of Sayyidina Zainab is, is an extraordinary role. If she was burdened with these responsibilities, if she was a man, it would have been extraordinary. She, was, she is a woman. There is a very heated debate in the United States about letting a woman be in the middle of the battlefield during wars. And, they, and then they reach the conclusion that it's not suitable for women to be in the battlefield. Yes, they can be in the command center, they can give orders, directions to men, but to actually be in the battlefield, it's not suitable. All of a sudden, Sayyid Zainab was in the middle of the storm. And one of the most important roles that Lady Zainab carried out was protecting the life of Imam Zain al-Abidin, the Imam of her time. You know, when we talk about Abu al-Fatih al-Abbas, the greatness of Abu al-Fatih al-Abbas lies in the fact that he defended Imam al-Hussein until he was killed. But eventually, Imam al-Hussein was killed as well. Imam al-Hussein did not survive. But the extraordinary role of Abu al-Fatih al-Abbas is to lay his soul before Imam al-Hussein, the Imam of his time. What Sayyidina Zainab did was protect Imam Zainab al-Abidin. When they raided the tents, the motto of the Umayyads was لا تبقوا على وجه هذه الأرض من أهل البيت المباقية Do not allow one individual, one person, one child of the progeny, the Prophet to remain alive. Obliterate them, uproot them, kill them all. And this was their aim. But they raided the tents. They found that there is a, a man lying in one of the tents. who was very ill. Imam Sayyidina Abdi said that. So Shino, gave his orders to kill Imam Zain al-Abidin straight away. One lady Zainab said, Wallah, you'll have to go over my dead body. You'll have to kill me first to be able to kill Imam Zain al-Abidin. And she threw herself on Imam Zain al-Abidin. And it was shameful back then for the Arabs to harm the women. Although they killed few women in Karbala, in the battlefield, but because this was in front of everyone, so he felt shameful. He couldn't kill Lady Zainab And if it wasn't for what she did on that day, we wouldn't have Imam Zaman. We wouldn't have Imam Sadiq. We wouldn't have Imam al Baqarah. And we wouldn't be sitting here to commemorate and remember Imam Hussein the Ahlul Bayt. And just to get a, a, a glimpse of how important that role was, we should go back to the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the story of Yusuf. The story of Yusuf took 40 years to, to happen and unfold. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in 111 verses only mentions the highlights of the story. One of the things that he mentions, which might sound a little strange, is that the, the plan or the plot that they had devised, the brothers, is to kill Yusuf. They said that we have to get rid of him by killing him. But all of a sudden, one of his brothers, a brother called Lawi, he said to them that if you want to get rid of him, rid of him, then there are other means to do so. We could throw him in a well, and a caravan will come, they will take him out of the well, and then he will be taken to another country or another continent. And this is how we can get rid of him. So they agreed. قال قائل منهم لا تقتلوا يوسف وألقوه في غيابة الجب لم تقرط بعض السيارة This is what you can do So they agreed and the rest is history 40 years later when Yusuf went to the outskirts of, of Egypt to receive his father when his father wanted to come 
with his brothers to Egypt. When the caravan moved, he saw his father from far away. He was supposed to alight from the back of his horse as a sign of respect for his father. But he didn't. He thought to himself that my father is too old. He probably can't see me because of the distance. So I'll stay on the back of my horse until he comes closer. And then I will alight from the back of my horse. When all of a sudden, Jibreel descends upon Yusuf. He says to him, Yusuf, open your hand. He opened his hand. He took away a light from the palm of his right hand. He said, Ya Habibi, Ya Jibreel, what is this light? He said, this is the light of prophethood. He said, you mean I'm not a prophet anymore? He said, no, you're a prophet, the son of a prophet, the grandson of a prophet. But prophet will not be in your lineage anymore. Your children, your descendants will not be prophets anymore. Why? Because of what you did. You should have respected your father. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects a lot more from prophets than he expects from us. And also, the role models for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْفٍ I mentioned this hadith a couple nights ago that if you frown, just a frown, just seem angry, look angry, look at them with angry eyes, your parents, when they have oppressed you, the hadith says, if they oppress you, you look at them with anger, لا يقبل الله منه صلاة ولا عملا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept any of your deeds. This is how much you should respect your parents. So he did not like from the back of his horse. This was the punishment, that the light of prophethood was taken away from his lineage. But prophethood should continue. Where should it go? قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ لَا تَقْتُلُوا يُوسُفُ And one of the brothers said, don't kill Yusuf. As a reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he protected a prophet, the reward was to put prophethood, the light of prophethood, in his lineage. So, and all the prophets from the Israelites were from the children of Lawi, including Musa Musa was the grand-grandchild of Lawi, the brother of Yusuf So Yusuf was his uncle. Yusuf wasn't his father. And this was an exception. In, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tradition because it was Ibrahim, a prophet of God, and then his son Ishaq, a prophet of God, then his son uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. No, Yaqub is the brother of Ishaq. Ibrahim, Ishaq, and then you have Yaqub. Sorry, it was Ismail, the brother of Ishaq. And then you have Yaqub, and then the son of Yaqub is Yusuf alayhi salam. But suddenly it goes to his brother Lawi. Lawi becomes the father of the prophets of Israelites. This was the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Lawi, the brother of Yusuf, for his intervention when he said, Don't kill Yusuf. And from this story, we get a glimpse of the status of Lady Zainab. Not once did she protect Imam Zayn Abidi, but in numerous occasions they protected the Imam from inevitable death. When they went to the city of Kufa, and they went inside the assembly of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, his palace, when he realized that there is a man with the caravan of the captives, he said, who is this man? Imam Zayn al-Abidin said, I am Ali, the son of Hussein. He said, didn't God kill Ali? The Imam replied by saying that our enemies, or some men, killed my brother Ali ibn al-Akbar. But I am another son of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. So he became furious. He ordered his guards to, guards to kill Imam Zayn al-Abidin. Well, Lady Zayn threw herself on Imam Zayn al-Abidin, saying that over my dead body, if you want to kill him, you have to kill me first. And that's why Imam Zayn al in the hadith says, You have been endowed with knowledge without, without 
the need to go and study. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that knowledge. And to be burdened with this responsibility, she has to be special. That's why some scholars suggest that although she wasn't infallible like other Imams, but she had an asma al-iktisabi, the earned infallibility, meaning that she never committed a sin willfully in her life. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want her to commit a sin, but she willfully did not commit a sin in her life. And the third occasion was when they went to Sham, Yazid wanted to kill Imam Zayn al-Abideen after he delivered the sermon. Lady Zainab said, over my dead body. You can't kill Imam Zayn al-Abideen. And there is a fourth occasion when she protected the Imam. When Imam Zayn al-Abideen saw his father Imam Hussein all alone in the battlefield. Hadith says that Imam, Imam Hussein came to bid farewell and give him the will of the Imam. He came inside the tent, he was heavily wounded, and blood was gushing from his body. So Imam Zayn al said, Abba, where is Habib ibn Mubarak? Habib was always with you. He said, Habib has been killed. Abba, Ayn al-Abbas, where's my uncle Abbas? He said, he's being killed. Ayn al Ali, he's being killed. When Imam Zayn al took his sword, he was very ill, he began to lean on the sword, using it as a walking stick to go to the battlefield and fight. When Imam Hussein said, Uqtahu ya Zaynab ibasi, hold him back, so that the lineage of Ahl al-Bayt would be severed. This was the fourth occasion. Lady Zaynab was unbelievable. They enter inside the city of Kufa. Everyone was rejoicing. Everyone was exhibiting happiness for what happened because they were able to defeat Imam Hussein and kill him. When all of a sudden, Lady Zainab, فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِمْ Be quiet! They all went quiet. And then she said to them, with the utmost confidence, and this is one of the, one of the qualities that such people, these people possessed, confidence in Iman, confidence in God, confidence in, in religion. She said to them, shut up. They went quiet. And then she said, Ya Ahl al Kufa, A'alimtum ayya kabdin li Rasulillahi faraytum. You have just killed the son of Rasulullah. Because Rasulullah used to call Imam Hassan Hussein, my children. You have just beheaded the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ayya kareematin lahu abrastum. You brought the woman folks outside for the, for the men to see. They began to cry when she said, she mentioned some of the tragedies that befell them on the day of Ashura. She said, فَلَا رَقَعَتِ الدَّمْعَةِ وَلَا سَكَنَةِ الْفَوَّةِ May you grieve until you die for what you have done. And she goes inside the assembly of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He has the head of Imam Hussein before him in a bucket. When he sees that the children and other women are sitting around Lady Zainab, walking with Lady Zainab when they enter. He said, who is this woman? Who is she? She didn't reply. Who are you? Identify yourself. She didn't reply. For the third time, who is she? And someone said that she is Zainab, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine this. Lady Zainab, just a couple of years ago, was the daughter of the ruler of the Muslim Empire, Amir al-Mu'mineen She was like the princess of her time. Although the family of Amir al were not privileged <coughs> during his rule, and he was he equated himself to the most impoverished citizen in his kingdom, but this earned her some respect. People revered her for being the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen Suddenly she is stripped from all these privileges. Not only people don't respect her anymore, people are making fun of her for what had befallen her. Such a person who is unfold before her eyes. And one of the tragedies was the martyrdom of her own children. Which again, as I said a couple nights ago, when they were killed, she stayed in the tent. She did not come out of the tent and, and call out, oh, my children are being killed. Although she did this when Ali al-Akbar was killed. When 
I knew that one was killed. Lady Zainab says that I saw the state of Imam Hussein, what Imam Hussein was enduring, what he was going through. Imam Hussein was about to surrender his soul because of the tragedy. So when I saw this, she came out of the tent calling out, Wa Wa Ibn So that Imam Hussein, his attention would be directed towards her. She didn't say anything when her children were killed. And they were her sacrifice on the day of Ashura. She was bereaved. She saw all these tragedies and she was respected some years ago. But now, there is a coup that is being made against the Mila Bumani, against the system of government, and against anything associated with Ahlul Bayt Ali Hussain. You would at least be nervous. You would be saddened. You would be depressed. You wouldn't be able to talk. And Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad said to her, how do you find what God did to you? And then he recited a verse that says, everything that happens to you is because of your own sins. Lady Zainab said, This verse is not talking about us. The verse that talks about us is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَاهَا Everything that befalls you, and he's talking about certain individuals. Everything that this befalls you had been prescribed before the inception of this world, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created anything. وَأَوَّلُ مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهِ عَلَى اللَّوْحِ قَتْلُ الْحُسَيْنِ The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed or wrote was the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. That's why Imam Hussein, when he left to go to the city of Kufa, he said, Allah is predestined for me to be killed. This is the verse that Allah subhanahu wa revealed and is talking about us. And then he says that, how do you find it? She said, Ma aytu illa jameela. What I saw was sheer beauty. Everything that emanates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful. Even the martyrdom of my brother Hussein. Even that head that has been put on a long lens from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful. But then she said, with, with utmost confidence, brothers and sisters, this is a great lesson that we must learn. Have confidence in your religion. Have confidence in your faith. A couple of years ago, I was in Los Angeles. I was invited by a family. Uh, and when I went there, I noticed that the, the mother and the sister doesn't wear hijab. So the mother then said to me, do you think I should wear a hijab? I said to her, as a religious minister, of course, that's my personal opinion and God's opinion. She said, but the problem is that I'm a manager of three restaurants in uh, Disney World, the, the famous theme park in, in Los Angeles. So it's a bit hard for me, post 9-11 and whatnot. People make fun of me. This might be frowned upon in, in this society. I said, do you believe in hijab? Do you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it an obligation upon women to wear hijab? She said, yes. I said, why is it that the Sikh, the Indian Sikhs, they wear the turban without anyone disrespecting them? If I find a Sikh, although I don't believe in their religion, but because they respect themselves when they respect their religion, they respect their convictions, they respect their faith. When you believe in something, you should respect yourself by adhering to your own beliefs. So I said, if you, if you don't believe, then I should talk to you about the roots of religion. Why we should believe in Islam? Why should we believe in God? But if you, once you believe in all of that, you should practice it. You should have confidence in what you believe in and practice it freely, especially in these societies, in the free world. Unfortunately, some people don't have the required confidence in their faith, especially some men uh, in which they can conceal their faith. A woman is wearing hijab. I mean, uh, She's an ambassador. She represents Islam. Everyone knows she's a Muslim. But for some men, they conceal their faith so that they wouldn't have to, uh, you know, 
bump into problems when they mingle with other people. Although, Islam is a, is a lifestyle. You have to adopt a lifestyle. For example, you can't sit on a table that there is, a, there is al alcoholic beverages being, being served. So you have to tell people, you can't shake hands with the opposite sex. If you practice your religion the way you should, this will make it much easier for the generations to come. But if you don't, people wouldn't know that this is your religion. You should tell the opposite gender that as a Muslim, I respect you. I'm not allowed to touch you. It's haram for me. No offense, but it's haram for me. And practicing your religion, having confidence in your religion, and respecting yourself by practicing your religion, will earn you the backing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Lady Zainab demonstrated on that day. And she is an example for us. I have a friend who lives in London. He said that I had a job interview. Uh, I was potentially uh, had an interview to work uh, in a fancy bank, HSBC. He said in the letter that they sent me to tell me about the venue and the time, they said that if there are any things that we need to know, anything that we need to know before the interview, please call this number and let us know. He said, and he's a very pious person, he said, I'll make this phone call, although I know that making this phone call will cost me the job at HSBC. He said, I called them. I said to them that as a Muslim, I am not allowed to shake hands with the opposite gender. So if the interviewer is a woman, I am not allowed to shake hands with her. I don't want her to be in an awkward position tomorrow when she extends her hands. I want to tell you that before I come. He said, I knew it, that this is going to cost me my job. So I went tomorrow to the building in London, the CBD, and I went to the 20th story. I had to wait in the waiting room for half an hour. I was very nervous. Suddenly they opened the door, they told me to go inside the room for the interview. When I entered inside the room, I realized that the person conducting the interview is a childhood friend. We were raised together for 15 years. So instead of shaking hands, we hugged each other. And he secured the job. The hadith says, لو أن السماوات والأرض If all the doors were sealed before you, على عبد فاتق الله جعل الله من أمره فرجا ومخرجا You practice piety, practice your religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create new doors for you. Create new doors for you. So when he said, how do you find what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to you? She said, ma ra'aytu illa jalila. Then she said, in whom? Illa qawmun katab Allah alayhim ul qadim. There are people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had predestined death upon them, martyrdom upon them. You'll be joined together on the Day of Judgment. And he will know very well who is the winner on that day, O oh, son of Marjana. She mentions the name of his mother. And everyone knew who Ibn Marjana was. He became angry. He wanted to lash Lady Zainab in front of everyone, but a man said to him that she's a woman. You shouldn't really be worried about what she says. The hadith says, When you forbid evil and enjoin good, this will not lessen your salary. And this will not lessen your the years that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endowed you with. For example, you're supposed to live 70 years, 80 years. By doing Yawm al-Ma'ruf, especially in the presence of a tyrant like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. And one of the qualities that Lady Zainab possessed was insight. She, was, she had absolute confidence in the future. She knew very well she could, she could foresee today, she could foresee the millions of people that marched towards the shrine of Imam Hussein, lamenting Imam Hussein. Yes, back then, children couldn't cry. So Kayla says, every time we wanted to 
crying every time we shed tears, they would attack, attack us with, the, uh, with spears, they would lash us. This is what they used to do to us. All of a sudden, there is a Husayniyah between Najaf and Karbala, which was the route that was taken by the caravan of the captives when they went to Kufa. They usually go through the palm trees and near the river to drink water. But because they wanted to be there swiftly, because Ubaidullah and Ziyad had ordered them to come as quickly as possible, they went through the desert, which is the same route today that is used by all the people that walk to Karbala from Najaf. I saw a big Husayniyah, Husayniyat Dam'at Uqayyah. A Husayniyah dedicated to one drop of tear that was shed from Ruqayya She couldn't cry. If they wanted to cry, they had to cry in secrecy, secretly. But all of a sudden, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. Husayniyat Dam'at Uqayyah. And this is what she told Imam Sayyidina Abideen. She said that this is a promise that has been made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and God doesn't break His promises when He said that a standard will be raised on this grave, on this burial site for your father. And the tyrants and his enemies will try to wipe it out. فَلَا يَزْدَادْ إِلَّا فَلُوَّهُ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Immortalize Imam Hussein, the cause of Imam Hussein, and anything associated with Abu Abdullah. And when she entered inside the assembly of Yazid, unbelievable, the tyrant of his time, a man said that when Lady Zainab started speaking, when she gave the, the lecture and the assembly, I thought it was her father, Amir al Mu'minin, talking. This is how articulate. This is how eloquent Lady Zainab was, without fear, although she was standing in front of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. She said to him that one day you would wish, if you never did this to us, you will regret this on the day of judgment. She slandered him and his forefathers. Ya ibn al-Tulaqa, amin al-adli takhdiruka harairak, wa sawqa bana, sawqa ka banat rasulillah. Oh, son of the freed ones! She reminded everyone and reminded him that when Rasulullah conquered Mecca, a man riding his horse began saying, اليوم يوم الملحمة, اليوم تسب الحرم. Today is the day that we will fight, we will kill each and every one of you now that they are, we are the majority of the Muslims again, the infidels. Rasulullah then said to Amir al-Mu'mineen to ride his horse and say, اليوم يوم المرحمة Today I will forgive everyone. اليوم تحب الحرم حرمة Today I will protect your uh, sanctity. Today I will protect your pride. Rasulullah is saying to his enemies, to the infidels. And then people came asking the Prophet, what should we do to the infidels? that fought, that, that killed your uncle Hamza, what should we do to these people? He said, You are free to go. Lady Zainab said to him, O oh, son of the freed ones, didn't my grandfather free your father Muawiyah, your grandfather Abu Sufyan? Then she said to him, Is this justice? Is this justice? You cover your wife, and she has a hijab, she has a cloak, she has a abaya and everything. While well, you have exposed us and made everyone look at us, Wallah, laqad fudahna, if tudahna min kifat al This was so painful for Lady Zainab and for all the women from the descendants of Rasulullah because they snatched their abaya. Yes, they were wearing a hijab to cover their hair, but the abaya and everything else was taken away from them. And this was very painful. His wife, Yazid, she had a wife who was a maid of Uthman ibn Affan. She was told, because it was a smearing campaign against Imam Hussein, that the caravan of the captives belonged to a group of men that did not believe in God. Kuffar. They rebelled against the Khalifa of the time, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and this is why they were killed. So, Hind came to see them, to see who they are, how they look, and whatnot. So, 
She asked the child where he was from. He said that, ask my auntie Zainab. If you want to ask someone, ask my auntie Zainab. So she wanted to ask Zayda Zainab. She said, where are you from? Which country? Which province? Which city? She said, we are from the city of Medina. Suddenly, she stood up. The wife of Yazid. She said, As-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Salam be upon you. She saluted the Prophet, O oh, Rasulullah. Then she said to Lady Zainab that a couple of years ago, I lived in Medina. I lived in Medina during Uthman's time. And I was brought up in the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But it's been years, probably a couple of decades, that I don't know anything about them. Do you, know, do you even know them? The family of Ali ibn Abi Talib. All the children's eyes were filled with tears. And Isaiah said, yes, yes I know them. She said, I wanted to ask you about Hassan, Hussein. I was brought up in their house. But because of the tragedy, because of the calamity, because of the scale of the calamity, Zainab looked differently. All her hair had become white. This happened a couple of years ago of a woman that saw a dream, saw a dream of her being in Karbala during Ashura. She witnessed some of the tragedies. It all happened in a dream. But when you're, you're in the dream, you don't know that this is not true. So she saw the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, and she woke up only in a single day, all her hair that was black became white. This is how horrific the tragedy is. And Lady Zainab witnessed all of that. She witnessed all of that. So she said, do you know anything about Imam Hassan and Hussein and Sukain Ub Kulthum? I want to ask you about these. Do you know Zainab? I really like Zainab. Do you know her? When all of the children began to cry loudly, yes, and then Zainab, I am Zainab that you're talking about. I am Zainab. They say that the caravan, the captives, they were taken to fifty to forty cities to parade them so that people would see them and rejoice for their defeat. And this year, my brother Sayyid Mehdi had an idea of he wanted to do this during the Al-Ba'in, of placing billboards in 40 major cities, capital cities of prominent countries, in major intersections, uh, bearing the message of Imam Hussain to give exposure to the message of Imam Hussain. This is how we should promote and propagate the message of Imam Hussain so that people would see that, see what happened. Because there's a hadith that says, we are all responsible for the blood of Imam Hussein. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us on the day of judgment how we dealt with the blood of Imam Hussein. This was an idea, inshallah, in the near future. We'll see this idea materialize. They were taken to 40 different cities. And one of the cities that were, they were taken to was the city of Hal al It happened during the day, and all the Women, men, and children would come out, some of them make fun, some of them throw pebbles at them. And this is how they showed affection and love to the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, I ask you no reward for what I gave you, for all the sacrifices that I made, for the religion of Islam that I brought to you. The only reward that I want from you is to display love for my progeny, for my relatives. This is how these people displayed their love, by throwing pebbles at them. All of a sudden, a woman from the crowd offers a loaf of bread to one of the children, but the child refuses to take that loaf. Why? Ask my auntie Zainab. إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ حَرَّمَ الصَّدَقَةَ عَلَيْهِ We're not allowed to take any sadaqa. We're the progeny of the Prophet. We should be respected. Sadaqah is for poor people. We should be respected and revered. I don't take sadaqah. So she goes to Lady Zainab. She wants to speak to her, to convince her to take the loaf of bread. She said to her that I wanted to give this loaf of bread to the children. 
they seem hungry. So the lady Zainab said, but no, I don't know the sadaqah, it's haram. She said, this is not a sadaqah. This is a nether that I, that I made a long time ago. A nether. She made like a vow. If something happened, then she would give uh, bread and food to the caravan of the captives that come to our city. He said, what's your story? She said, what's your story? She said, a long time ago, when I was a child, I suffered from a disease in my eye. And the doctors couldn't do anything. So my father took me to the city of Medina, and Rasulullah was still alive. We traveled from Aleppo to the city of Medina. So my father said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, this is my only child, my daughter. I want you to recite a dua to miraculously cure my daughter. He said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, I will call my grandson Hussein. So he called his grandson Hussein, who was a little child, probably four or five years old. Because when the Prophet passed away, Imam Hussein was only six or seven years old. He called his son Hussein, his grandson Hussein. He said, I will ask my grandson Hussein to do a dua, and this will cure your eyes. He did a dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously cured me. When my father wanted to reward Rasulullah, Rasulullah said, I want a reward for you. But one day, a caravan of a captives, of captive captives will be brought to your city. I want your daughter to offer them some food because they will be hungry, they will be thirsty. And I've been waiting since then. It's been so many years, so many decades. I was waiting for this moment. And this is the first time that a caravan of captives is brought to my city. The children were listening. Some of the women were listening. And they were crying. Lady Zainab said to this woman, Do you recognize Hussein? She said, I was very young. But yes, because of the miracle that happened, I still remember him saying, I still remember him vividly. She said, so if I show you him saying, would you remember him? She said, yes, if I look at him, I remember him. She said to him, she said to her, look at the head over that long lens. She looked at the head of Abba Abdullah.